Hello, and thank you for joining us. My name is Eric Waken. I'm the Deputy Director of the Hoover Institution and the Director of its Library and Archives. <clears throat> Welcome to the first in a series of talks to celebrate the publication of Fanning the Flames, Propaganda in Modern Japan, edited by Dr. Kei Weda, Curator for Japanese Diaspora Collections, and featuring the essays of a number of distinguished scholars, two of whom you'll be hearing from today. Uh, the book and the exhibit bring together scholarly essays and archival material from the Hoover Institution Library and Archives and detail the role of Japanese propaganda in fostering na national identity and mobilizing participation in the country's transformation and wartime activities, beginning with the first Sino-Japanese War and continuing to the end of World War II. Um, allow me to thank my colleagues, including Dr. Weda, Samira Bazorgi, Marissa Ree, Kira Peacock, and many others at the Library and Archives for helping to make the book possible, and also Barbara Ariano and her colleagues at the Hoover Press. And finally, the community of Hoover overseers and other supporters of the institution, without whom nothing we do would be possible. Um, today, I'm going to introduce um, Dr. Michael Austin, who's going to moderate the presentation. He will introduce our speaker. We'll hear from the speaker, and then there will be a discussion between the two of them and some questions at the end, and then we'll close out uh, just before the hour's up. So. Without further ado, today's talk is titled Anchors of History, the Long Shadow of Japanese Imperial Propaganda. And our speaker will be introduced, as I said, by Hoover's own Michael Austin, who is the Patient J. Treat Distinguished Research Fellow in Contemporary Asia. Michael is a historian by training, specializing in US policy in Asia and geopolitical issues in the Indo-Pacific region. His publications include Negotiating with Imperialism, The Unequal Treaties and the Culture of Japanese Diplomacy, and Asia's New Geopolitics, Essays on Reshaping the Indo-Pacific. Previous to coming to Hoover, and thankfully he did come to Hoover, Dr. Austin was an associate professor of history at Yale, a resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute, and a visiting professor at the University of Tokyo. Please welcome Misha Austin. Misha. Eric, thank you very much, and thank you uh, to all of you for joining today. It's, it's my pleasure to be able to introduce uh, Brock Kushner uh, to talk about his chapter in this collection, uh, The Anchors of History. Before I do that, though, I just want to mention uh, the book, uh, which we are here to celebrate, Fanning the Flames, Propaganda in Modern Japan. Um, this is a unique and ambitious book. It's, it's also a beautifully done book, if, if you haven't gotten a copy yet, uh, that covers multiple types of Japanese media from the first Sino-Japanese War in 1894 uh, through World War II. Uh, the book features primarily two collections from uh, the Hoover's uh, archives, uh, multicolored prints made from Japanese woodblock printing process known as Nishikie, uh, these are usually of battles and political scenes, and also kamishibai, which were paper plays of World War II home front propaganda, which targeted women and children uh, in the empire of Japan. Uh, the book also offers a glimpse into the worldwide propaganda war by sharing some of Hoover's rich multinational archive and library, library collections. Um, there is not only an online, uh, or not a, are we only doing this online discussion and discussion series, uh, but there's also an online and physical exhibition, which we hope you all will be able to see either in person or through your computers. Uh, these will be planned for opening in the fall of this year in 2021. And a particular part of the, of the online exhibition will be an interactive map journey that follows the life cycle of the Chinese ironclad battleship that we're going to be talking about today with Barack Kushner. So let me turn to welcoming Barack. It's a pleasure to introduce Barack Kushner, an old friend of mine who is the professor of His East Asian history and chair of Japan studies in the faculty of Asian and Middle Eastern studies at the University of Cambridge. Barack has edited numerous books and written several monographs, including the award-winning Men to Devils, Devils to Men, Japanese War Crimes and Chinese Justice. In 2015, he hosted several episodes of a major Chinese documentary on Japanese war crimes and is currently writing a book entitled The Construction of Injustice in East Asia, Japan versus its Neighbors. Uh, Barack has studied in Tokyo. He is a guest professor at Shanghai Jiao Tong University. He also received the 15th Nakasone Yasuhiro Award for Excellence in 2019. 
So Barack, it's a pleasure to welcome you to the Hoover uh, Institution and to talk about your chapter in Fanning the Flames. Thanks very much, uh, Dr. Oslin, for the warm introduction. And I'm going to, I think, hopefully success successfully share my screen now with everybody. I'd also like to thank uh, Dr. Kei Ueda, uh, uh, the curator of the Japanese materials at the Hoover Institute, and her fine team for making all of this possible. Uh, the book, which you can see over here uh, on my left, is a richly detailed and I think informative foray, foray into propaganda using many new materials. It's a real shame that we, we couldn't do this in person as it was initially planned, uh, but hopefully we'll be able to do something like this in, in the near future. Um, Misha, you and I agreed that I would talk for about uh, 15 minutes. We, feel, we felt that people are probably zoomed out all across the world uh, and that perhaps a conversation would be better than merely just having me uh, talk. So I'm gonna use the, the 15 minutes that were given to me to talk about first uh, how I got into this topic, which might seem a little bit um, off the charts, and then talk about how I think it's uh, added to our uh, a new perspective to our understanding of how uh, propaganda operates and the evolution of propaganda uh, in East Asia. And initially, really, it starts with me reading the memoirs of a, a KMT, a Chinese nationalist military attache uh, to the Japanese occupation. And in the middle of his book, he says, uh, we repatriated Qing dynasty war booty from Japan back to nationalist China in 1947. And then he kind of goes on. And I thought while well, reading this, well, wait a second, what does this mean? What war booty from the Qing dynasty? What was being repatriated? Why did they want it to come back? And it got me to think that we tend to think of war as um, ending upon defeat, and thus the propaganda that mobilized the populations for war that bolstered everything in the mobilization uh, somehow disappears or ends with the declaration of surrender or defeat. But what I think we're looking at uh, here is a bit longer term. And I think this creates uh, the story that I look at here really kind of informs us about what I call a propaganda feedback loop in East Asia, or this long and continuous competition for narrative control over uh, who has dominion over East Asia and really what was the meaning of the war. And so it's the opportunity through this one small portal of a story about some anchors to talk about Japanese propaganda and to understand that propaganda is not just a one-way street, that it works in coordination and it works internationally going back and forth. And I think in part, this also rewrites our timeline of history, that the war in East Asia when Japan surrenders in August of 1945 isn't necessarily over for the East Asian participants. To go back to the beginning of the story, what the Chinese military attache was talking about in 1945 and 1946 and 47 and getting that war booty back starts with propaganda battles during the Sino-Japanese War in 1894-95. This was essentially a war for control over the Korean Peninsula. Uh, most international observers expected the Qing dynasty Navy to uh, vanquish very quickly, the much smaller and uh, less well rehearsed or practiced uh, Japanese, but that's not really um, what happened. Um, although within this war, there were two enormous Chinese Qing era naval vessels, the Dingyuan and the Junyuan. And they dwarfed really anything in the Japanese naval arsenal. And the story starts here with what happened to them. Essentially, the Qing Navy piles miscalculation on top of poor strategy, on top of bad luck. Uh, the Zhen Yuan uh, beaches itself uh, on mines in the harbor. The Ding Yuan is kind of put out of commission and half sunk. And both of the naval vessels in parts become war booty of the Japanese Imperial Navy. This is celebrated in a massive moment in Shinobaza Lake in late 1894 uh, in the middle of Tokyo, where a mock battle of plaster of Paris uh, models of the ships between the Japanese Imperial Navy and the mock-ups of uh, the Qing Dynasty Imperial Navy, uh, fireworks kind of 
replica replicate the mortars that would have passed uh, between both ships and the anchors of the Genuen after this huge uh, festival spectacle of the battle, the anchors of the Genuen are put on display on the edge of the Shinobaza Lake. And this was uh, an unprecedented moment in Japanese domestic propaganda to celebrate uh, what had not yet been an official victory over the Qing, but what looked to uh, become that very soon. The bill in approximate US dollars uh, of the time would have come to about $2.5 million. Extra trains are put on the lines between Yokohama and Tokyo to deal with the influx of visitors. So the genuine has kind of repaired, it's commandeered directly into uh, the Japanese Imperial Navy as uh, part of the reparations. It travels around East Asia and it arrives at the Yokosuka base to great fanfare and uh, kind of adulatory articles in the newspaper at the time. The Dingyuan, the other massive naval vessel, is partly salvaged by a Japanese uh, politician from Fukuoka who takes parts of the ship and puts it kind of in a memorial hall that's on his estate. This later then uh, becomes uh, the dormitory for a shrine uh, in Fukuoka as well. But really what's important here is that the use of war booty claimed from uh, the Qing dynasty and then put on display all over Japan. Uh, to kind of give you an idea of how much this galvanizes and mobilizes the population at the time, an editorial in the Yomiuri newspaper proffered that such items showed, quote, the brave valor of our Navy and military, and also promoted our honor and imperial power to the world. And the presentation of these spoils wasn't just on the edge of the Shinobaza Lake with the huge anchors, but it was also all over the Japanese archipelago in massive dioramas, uh, in castle grounds, at schools, uh, in libraries, and elsewhere. And it became a form of kind of entertainment or edutainment and state propaganda, which linked youth, the military, and military expansion into a kind of wondrous consumer uh, experience for people uh, within Japan. War booty displays at the Asakuni Shrine at one point in 1895 grew so popular that many entrepreneurs set up small shops and amusement uh, stalls outside of the shrine because they couldn't actually uh, get their materials inside. This continues in the interwar period from 1905 uh, after the Russo-Japanese War until about the early 1930s. And generally, we tend to think of this time as one when there isn't much uh, propaganda for war and war mobilization. But what we find here in the interwar period is really propaganda for imperial mobilization, an expansion of prints, uh, newspaper articles, statues of godlike soldiers who had kind of demonstrated their heroism, both in the Sino-Japanese War and the Russo-Japanese War, and these proliferate uh, around uh, Japan as well. In 1912, the Genuine is finally decommissioned. That, re that uh, reclaimed naval vessel from the Qing dynasty is decommissioned from uh, the Japanese Imperial Army. And a book is written about it, as you can see on this slide. And after, even after that in 1912, the memory of Japan having vanquished the Qing dynasty is being recalled. And one of those anchors is purchased by a religious uh, cleric who kind of has formed his own new religion in Okayama Prefecture in Japan. And he builds a whole shrine around one of these anchors as well. Things develop through the 1920s and the 1930s within Japanese propaganda that really kind of starts with the drive in 1894 and reaches a crescendo by the time we get to the 1930s. And it's really this linkage between uh, consumer companies, uh, media companies, or companies that create products and want to also sell them to uh, imperial era uh, Japanese, but also transportation companies that will be bringing, rail companies that will be bringing individuals to these various events, either the Shinobaza Lake, 
1894, 95, or in this case in Osaka in 1938. I don't have time in the 15 minutes to go into the Kamishibai linkage. If you get the book and read the chapter, uh, you'll learn more about that. Perhaps it's something that we can discuss in the Q&A. Um, but it's really here the escalation of propaganda as a moment to consume, but also observe domestically in Japan what's happening in or on the Chinese continent. We saw that first with the anchors, that we saw that as the vessels are actually dismembered and various parts are uh, placed in certain settings where they are visually attractive and able to be shared and understood and experienced by the Japanese. And this comes to a crescendo in the uh, China Incident Holy War Expo in 1938 in Osaka. And if you look more closely at the picture, you can see basically they transform a baseball stadium into a battlefield. The outside uh, seating, the stadium itself, the five layers become a naval destroyer. And on each layer, uh, participants, those who come to see, can view war booty claimed from China once again, different armaments, flags, all sorts of uh, personal items as well. And then the very baseball field itself was transformed into a Chinese battlefield. One would think, in a sense, that the story of the anchors of history, these anchors, would end with the end uh, of the war. But that's not what happened, because as I reminded you at the beginning of what really got me started and interested in this project was the fact that the Chinese claim these anchors back. But here's a real twist to the story, because it's not the Qing era Chinese that are reclaiming this, these anchors. It is the Chinese nationalist government that initially brings these anchors back to Shanghai. They try to convince the American occupation authorities that to allow the anchors to stay on the edge of the Shinobaz Lake would really be allowing the Japanese to continue vaunting uh, militarism, something that the occupation had wanted to get rid of. And so after a long series of letters and kind of semi-persuasive campaigns, the American authorities accede because they're the ones that pretty much run the occupation and the Chinese are able to repatriate those anchors. That is short-lived, of course, because as we remember, the Chinese nationalists have to flee mainland China to Taiwan when they lose in the Chinese Civil War that ends in 1949 with Mao's kind of declaration of a new China uh, from the balcony uh, at the Forbidden Palace. And then the story continues just a bit more because the anchors are still part of this competition over control of the narrative of what the war was all about, or in a sense, who has the power, uh, who can demonstrate the visual power of the representations of this history. And it's the CCP. It's the Chinese nationalist, uh, excuse me, it's the Chinese Communist Party uh, in 1959, which builds a new museum in the center of Beijing. And in the center of this museum, even today, you can go and visit one of the genuine anchors. Uh, this was a museum that was expressly designed and decreed by a Premier Zhou Enlai to symbolize new China, and it was completed in 1959. The museum had the instructions to establish the hegemony of the interpretation of history by controlling both the retelling of the past and the means of representation. So let me conclude here uh, with a few remarks that I actually wrote down so I don't go off the cuff too much. The memory of the Japanese empire was transmitted through successive Chinese governments, even though they all claimed they were revolutionary in their own way. Ruling authority changed from the Qing dynasty through the Chinese nationalist through to the Chinese Communist Party by 1949. But public memory did not always follow suit. How the Japanese responded to those transformations during the same eras helped shape the world we currently face. The acts of remembering and forgetting by the Chinese communists, nationalists, and Japanese demonstrate how the textures of imperial Japanese propaganda, the very materials within these anchors, left a much larger footprint than previously recognized on the complex network of wartime and post-war relationships in the region. And I will end there.
And well, Barack, uh, thank you. That was that was wonderful. What we want to do now for the rest of our time is have a conversation between Barack and myself, but also to incorporate your questions. And if you will go down to the bottom of your Zoom screen, you'll see the little Q&A button and you'll be able to submit questions to us uh, that we will try to get to as, as we have a, a discussion between us about the issues that Barack raised and more broadly about, about the book itself. And that's really where I wanna start, uh, Barack, is, is with the book, which uh, again at base, is a book about uh, the the printed material that is that is propaganda. And what's so interesting, I think, about your um, your chapter is that you move between the printed into the physical, into the material, uh, and how they reinforce each other. But I want to ask about the um, the question of Japanese propaganda as a whole. Um, Japan was certainly not the the first country to adopt propaganda. Uh, printed propaganda for both a domestic and a, and a foreign audience. Um, but it was also doing it at pr pretty much at the time that it was modernizing and becoming, uh, you know, an imperialist country acting like other Western imperialist countries. So the question I have, the first one is, where did Japan learn to utilize propaganda? Where did they learn what was effective? Where did they learn how to distribute it? Uh, was it a process of trial and error? Uh, did it come from the pre-Meiji, meaning the, the Tokugawa feudal past? How was it that they were able within just a few decades to become so adept uh, and sophisticated at using propaganda that really stretched around the world? Excellent opening question. I wouldn't have expected anything less. What, what an interesting way to kind of start off thinking about how Japan starts off on this journey. I think and it kind of goes perhaps to our understanding of Japanese propaganda has tended to be mainly focused on World War II. So immediately we leap to looking at how Japan is looking at Germany, how Japan is looking at Italy, and then learning uh, from them. And of course, there is a great uh, it, there is a great participation and kind of uh, involvement among those three. Prior to that, of course, the Japanese were in the 1920s were, were greatly mobilized by Soviet propaganda, even though. Of course, communism eventually gets quashed and is banned uh, fundamentally in Japan. They're very much taken by uh, the visuality of, of the posters uh, and, and the use of kind of writing and, and Russian literature, Soviet literature after 1917 um, in that way, how they're mobilizing their own masses. But I think if we go back to 1894, 95 with the Sino-Japanese War, it's really building on the back of the Meiji state itself uh, mobilization. So if, we're, if we look at the 1870s with how Japan creates this idea that Shinto is the state religion, there is the great promulgation campaign, a campaign in which the very small and not well-funded Meiji state hires an enormous number of, of local individuals. It hires Shinto priests, it hires Buddhist priests, to kind of argue against themselves, to mobilize individuals for the state. It hire, hires Dakugo, Japanese comedians and teachers to all go out. And so um, it also, it has newspapers in a sense already on board, right? There's no, there's no independent fourth estate in Japan, arguably until after 1952, when American uh, censorship and the American occupation ends. But particularly for Meiji, Newspapers had to pay a deposit to the government and get government authorization before they started publishing. So already the government has uh, media collaborators with it who can also punish if they're producing information or materials contrary to what the state wants. And when we look at some of the individuals who are, are painting, the, some of the individuals who are drawing, yes, uh, many of them go back to the Tokugawa era, particularly the Bakamatsu, the late era, uh, the professionals, but not that many. And we think of a lot of the people who, who were writing or publishing at that time, at least in terms of kind of popular culture, it ceases to sell in Meiji. And so I think we have to look at those individuals, the new technicians, the new uh, commercial artists, people in the new media, because newspapers hadn't existed before, uh, the pageantry surrounding the creation of the Meiji emperor himself. All of those individuals and all of those policies and processes uh, form what become the proliferation of the publication of print media with the Sino-Japan War, uh, which actually 
we should mention is a very racist war uh, at its heart. Japanese propaganda is um, vituperative against the Qing. Uh, it uh, depicts them in very gross and base ways. And this is also a new experience uh, for Japan to really kind of turn on how it had portrayed uh, the Chinese before. And all of that, I think, plays uh, comes to play a role because of the way in which the Meiji mobilization of the new state galvanized itself and also mobilized individuals to think in a very different way that they had than they had before. It's also worth mentioning uh, that Japan, of course, was a very literate society, uh, even in the Tokugawa period, uh, and by by many measures more literate than Western society. So there was a there was an audience that had been uh, developed, I think, over um, decades, if not even in certain cases, centuries to be receptive to uh, visual media. Uh, and as you mentioned in what's known as the Bakumatsu or the end of the Bakufu period, there were in particular enormous numbers of broadsheets that were coming out talking uh, about the, the arriving barbarians, meaning Commodore Perry or the other Europeans, and, and very highly decorated, uh, illustrated, not decorated, but illustrated. Uh, and then in, in the wars uh, that ended, the, the brief wars that ended the Tokugawa Bakufu and, and uh, were the, the transition to the Meiji uh, period, which was, of course, a civil war inside of Japan. There was also this type of propaganda that showed imperial forces defeating the, the backwards samurai, the backwards Tokugawa forces. So in a way, it's really transposed from an internal J Japanese debate over what's modern, meaning the, the modern Meiji state, uh, and samurai and feudal values are not modern, to Japan being modern and China not being modern. Uh, one thing that struck me in your uh, in your book again was this, uh, or in your chapter in the book, was this use of of um, or, or this discussion of the use of both material uh, items for propaganda and then the the type of printed propaganda that that we often think about. And and it's interesting because at least today in the United States, and I would say around most of the world, um, the the propaganda, so to speak, of of wartime really has less to do with the an enemy and more to do with the country itself, meaning there are memorials to different soldiers, different divisions, different battles. But what you don't see, for example, are things like the two anchors in Ueno Park. Uh, what you don't see is, is, is a sort of physical reminder of the defeat of an enemy. I mean, there, there can be in certain cases like the you know, having a, an airplane, uh, but but that's more for for those who are interested in airplanes rather than saying we captured this. So where did the Japanese, in your view, get this idea that what we wanted to do was show how we had defeated an enemy and do it in a way that you could actually move it around the country, so millions of people potentially could see this this physical manifestation of our superiority. It's an interesting point. I mean, it really depends what area of, what field of Japanese propaganda you're looking at, right? I mean, Donald Ritchie and others, when they first looked at Japanese wartime propaganda films, they said, oh my God, these are great humanistic films. They have, you know, to us, they don't seem propagandistic at all. The enemy is never apparent, right? There's a glorification of the sacrifice of Japanese soldiers within these films, but there's never any animosity toward the other, which was very different from obviously uh, other films. Um, I, you know, it goes, I, I've been reading, I've been rereading uh, a book by Sato Takumi, who is a Japanese uh, professor of media. And he has this interesting point that as you get to kind of late Meiji, so, you know, the, the turn of the century, 19th to 20th, and then through the interwar period, what's happening outside of Japan becomes very important for how people think of their own personal and political security within Japan, which was something very different from pre-Meiji. Right? Pre-Meiji, no one really cared about what was happening outside of Japan. And then once Japan finds itself in the midst of this very insecure position on the fringes of China that's being colonized, uh, kind of as the, as the Russian bear, as they called it, kind of bearing down from the north and the uncertainty, the uncertainty of what's happening on the Korean Peninsula, what's happening outside of Japan becomes quickly very important. And to Matt, you know, that you raised the point of it's a very literate society. It's a literate society that suddenly feels the need to read about and to consume and understand what's happening about that. So in part, I think the push 
on the government level, on the Tokyo level, to visualize this domination over East Asia, in a sense, informs the population that Japan has arrived. That the sacrifices, there are not that many sacrifices yet in the Sino-Japan War, sacrifices will come out much more with the Russo-Japanese War, which is only 10 years later. Um, but you know, mobilizing young men, in a sense, from their hometowns across the sea to China, not all of them coming back, um, that the need to kind of demonstrate what Japan is gaining from this and the need to demonstrate the, the visual moment of success over uh, what were considered to be absolutely enormous imperial vessels that the Qing had um, at its disposal, uh, were very important. And it's not just the governments itself, it's as we saw with the various individuals, either a religious uh, founder of his own sect, but also uh, the politician in Fukuoka, individuals of great prestige and wealth also want to take part in this moment of sharing and displaying domination over the Qing to demonstrate that, that Japan um, had arrived. And I think that becomes, that becomes very palpable. There's not, it's not a moment there's no smoking gun single decision. I think it's the slow accretion of uh, the demonstration of war booty being a very powerful motivating factor to draw in participation from uh, the masses. And then once that becomes commercially successful on shrine grounds at one's estate in Fukuoka to a religious uh, shrine in Okayama, that actually feeds the process for decades to come. We're getting a lot of questions and, and we're going to turn to them, including questions about um, today and the future and how uh, propaganda plays into relations between Japan and China uh, and also the United States. Um, but before we, we get to, to those, I, I want to raise a, a different question, actually one that, that came through to us. But note, uh, interestingly, because you've mentioned a couple of times, Barack, that uh, the the Zhen uh, and the Ding Yuan were, were gigantic vessels, and yet in the the uh, the woodblock print that you showed, and and that's reprinted in the in the volume, it's the Japanese vessels which are big, and it's the Chinese vessels which not only are smaller but they're older. They look more like wooden ships, and so there's a there's a change, uh, or is there a change even in the in the narrative that it's it's less about you know, it, this is not news, obviously. This is not a news account of what still was an extraordinary Japanese victory over the traditional Chinese hegemon. But in fact, it was it was inverted, again, to show the modernization, the white ships, the white-hulled ships of, of Japan versus the small wooden black ships of China. I mean, certainly that's a motif within, within the propaganda, right? But that doesn't play out in reality at all. I mean, it's I was, I was adding a few points for a forthcoming piece. And in, in 1951, just as kind of the Korean War is, is reaching a crescendo, Wasaji, uh, Wasaji Tetsudo, a famous Japanese philosopher, uses what he recalled from being a child and seeing the, the genuine come into Yokosuka port uh, to, to recall how great and how big the Qing Navy was. And he's making the parallel with uh, the kind of the Chinese onslaught onto the Korean Peninsula to help Japanese recall, in a sense, how small they, they were. So no, I think it's really just a propaganda uh, motif or uh, kind of technique. And of course, it, it didn't reflect reality at all. But of course, as these are consumed more massively across Japan, it also looks good in itself. So you can feel good about yourself at the same time. So we have an interesting question from Claudia Huntington, who asks, um, presumably the propaganda was very effective with regard to the populace, but was there any successful independent voice, and I'm assuming she means a, a contrarian voice, in that time uh, during Meiji uh, that was able to get any kind of foothold? Um, so what were there alternative voices? Uh, what were there press censorship laws? What, what could be a countervailing narrative to this imperialism? Uh, because you see that in the United States at, at close to the same time, there's actually a very strong anti-imperialist movement headed by people like Mark Twain and others when we get to the, uh, the Spanish-American War. But in Japan, at almost the same period, are there other voices? In the 1894-95 era, uh, not so many. There is intense censorship. Uh, it is expensive to run newspapers. It is expensive to produce. Uh, I haven't 
I mean, certainly you always, you know, you have, you have, well, those people who will la later be labeled uh, socialists, you have anarchists, but they don't really come up until the, the 19 teens or so. And then they're an ongoing feature of the Japanese counter narrative to what the government wants to talk about. 1894, 95, uh, not effectively yet. Um, you, I would question though, you know, how, effective propaganda, how do we know it was effective propaganda, right? One of my points in looking at this feedback loop is that we're saying effective propaganda for Japan in 1894, 95, and then 1905 because Japan beats the Qing dynasty and then it beats the Russians. But we're not saying Japanese propaganda was effective in 1945 because Japan lost. Whereas I would argue that Japanese propaganda continues to be effective because it's something that both the Chinese nationalists and the Chinese communists in 1947 and then 1959 thought that they had to keep arguing against even though the war had already been over. So I think we perhaps need to, to think more carefully or redefine how we're thinking about effective propaganda and it shouldn't just be linked to who wins the war. We have a, another question, an interesting one. You just mentioned the Russo-Japanese War, which ran from 1904 to 1905. And if anything, to the West, the, the defeat of Russia by Japan was a bigger shock than Japan defeating the Qing Empire. And so we have a question uh, whether there was any difference in the propaganda between the two wars, between the Sino-Japanese War and the Russo-Japanese War. Yes. The... One of the major features is, of course, that the numbers of Japanese, of young Japanese men who are being drafted and sent over uh, to the battles for the Russo-Japan War are much larger, and the losses are greater, and a victory is barely eked out at the beginning. Um, as, as you say, there is tremendous elation at the success of the Japanese in their ability to defeat the Russians. The, the structure of the propaganda itself remains heavily on print. Um, war heroes from the Russo-Japanese War will make their way more quickly and in more numerous uh, numbers into large, sometimes colossal statues around Japan, mainly in front of rail stations and whatnot. And these are then put onto postcards and they're sent around uh, the growing empire. Now that Taiwan um, is, is part of the empire. And of course, uh, Korea is part of the unofficial empire until 1910. So there's a further linkage of identifying uh, heroes or individuals or great moments or cities that Japan has conquered, areas that battles that Japan has won. Um, with materials that then proliferate more in non-military areas, such as the mail, such as books, such as posters, such as children's stories. And I would argue as we move later on into the 1930s, these then come out in what we call kamishibai, the children's paper plates that are in, in some ways wholly disconnected from official mobilization propaganda initially, and then become part and parcel of um, the governments and the uh, imperial forces' great efforts to mobilize all layers of Japanese society for total war. So we have a, a question, speaking of, of total war, we have a question uh, about the uh, China Incident Holy War Exposition of 1938. And again, the picture wasn't up for that long, but it's it's fascinating if you look at it. It's, it's just enormous. It's taking over this baseball field and, and uh, the, the areas around it and, and recreating battlefields. Um, the question is, who planned and organized it? Um, was it part of the total, total war mobilization efforts uh, of the government? Because by 1938, you've already had the Marco Polo incident and, and Japan is essentially engaged in full-fledged war on the Chinese mainland. Right, so what's uh, this kind of ties in with a, a question that we got uh, before the talk from Jennifer Weisenfeld from, from Duke University, this kind of linkage between propaganda and, and commercial art. And many of these massive events are underwritten by media companies. Uh, and for the Osaka uh, event, for the Osaka Stadium, it's Asahi, the Osaka Asahi newspaper, linking with uh, one of the major rail companies in the Osaka area. Uh, of course, with the full authorization from the government, and importantly, the full authorization from the Imperial Armed Forces. So 
The government and the imperial armed forces didn't always agree. And of course, to get war booty, it has to come from the imperial army. Uh, they all work in coordinate, coordination. Whether the initial idea came from the Asahi or uh, the imperial army uh, remains unclear. I would say based on what I've seen elsewhere that it came from Asahi itself. Asahi ran many of these um, all over from th during the 1930s and they brought in huge profit. They also then sold the magazines and it tied Asahi in with being able to show more pictures of what's happening in the battles on the Chinese continent and therefore sell more newspapers. Japan was able, I think it was, if I'm not mistaken, after 1936 to telegraph back pictures of what was actually happening on the front. Before that, they would have to kind of fly back, which they still did in their own airplanes, uh, back and forth. So it's both its own internal mobilization for the war, getting the population to consume the propaganda about the war, which ties in then with its own profit margin which I think is, is a unique aspect in many ways of what came to be Japanese propaganda practices by the 1930s. Of course, we had that you know, in the United States with William Randolph Hearst and the, the Spanish-American War, if not even pushing to have the war declared, but it's fascinating to see that connection. Um, moving forward a little bit uh, in time to the occupation, we have a couple of questions. Um, my Hoover colleague, Norman Neymark, asks, how did the Japanese deal with controlling the narrative after the war, uh, given the American occupation? And another question that's related to that is, who or what entity uh, during the U.S. occupation had the authority to determine the measures to be implemented to counter or deconstruct uh, the information space which had been manufactured by the Imperial Japanese propaganda, and, and they'd be interested in some examples of that as well. So there's two major ways in which the American-led occupation tries to shape the narrative of the war toward Japanese. The first really is the Tokyo trial. It's at the Tokyo trial of uh, Japanese class A war criminals where the narrative about what Japan had done, bringing out testimony and evidence about all the atrocities, linking this to an imperial conspiracy was first brought out. And this is really, this is uh, forced to be published in Japanese newspapers, people attend, uh, this, this goes out. Um, the, there is a civil information uh, department also within the American occupation government, which creates a, a whole entity of, um, this is the truth. It's both a, radio both a radio show and in newspapers of trying to get the stories out about what had actually happened on the Chinese continent and elsewhere uh, in East and Southeast Asia with you know, Japanese aggression, with Japanese atrocities uh, against locals. And there are varying um, degrees of understanding of whether or not this was effective. Recently, uh, Ariyama Taro in Japan has written that because this was all this information was translated from English, written by the, the SCAP authorities, the American occupation authorities, and translated into Japanese, it didn't read as Japanese. And the stories didn't jive with Japanese suffering during the war. The Americans wanted to portray what was happening outside of Japan uh, during the war to the Japanese, but the Japanese at, at that time were focused on what had happened to them over the last several years, particularly since the American air rates had increased over the last few years of the war. And so there, there's a real kind of gap in how that information is being processed and how that information is being received. To go to the beginning part of the question, how did the Japanese deal with the narrative? They waited. And we see preparations for reclaiming the narrative in particular of the Tokyo war crimes trial already happening just before the occupation ends in April of uh, 1952, and then an onslaught of uh, government declarations and cabinet decisions to kind of reclaim the territory of what people felt the war was actually about. And this is a conversation uh, that continues to this day. So this competition over the narrative of what the war meant for the Japanese and then how the war ended and America's role in ending the war with the atomic bomb um, are gristle for this conversation, even in the 21st century. 
Interestingly, we've received no questions about China, and I, I actually want to turn to China in a second. But before that, uh, we have an interesting question from a Mami Mizutori, and I would like to uh, ask you her question, which is, um, it's actually a really, really good question, which is, what would you say are the unique characteristics of Japanese war propaganda in comparison to Western war propaganda uh, at the time. Now, I don't know if she's referring to World War II or earlier, um, probably I would think more World War II, but uh, in any case, yeah, how is it different? And of course, you know, many people uh, interested in the topic have read uh, John Dower's War Without Mercy. They're familiar with his, his argument about the dehumanization on both sides and how it played out in propaganda. Uh, were they exactly equal or, or was there something different uh, in the approach of the two sides? I don't think I have a specific answer for the actual processes and the structures. I think generally fairly equal, certainly as John Dower has showed and Stuart Lone and, and Donald Keene have shown for, for other wars, the, the, the Sino-Japan War and, and others for the Russo-Japan War. What strikes me as the main difference is, in a sense, not to be cheeky, but to go back to the title of this chapter, The Anchors of History, in that when we tend to look at things from the Western perspective in propaganda, we tend to use what uh, Henry Rousseau, a French historian, calls the last catastrophe, that each war is kind of self-contained and doesn't necess necessarily refer back to what happened 10 years prior, or what happened 30 years prior. And for me, one of the major differences in looking at the evolution of Japanese propaganda is that Japanese propaganda with China doesn't start in World War II, doesn't start with the uh, 21 demands just at the moment of the Paris Peace Conference. It doesn't start in 1894, 95, it starts in 1886. It starts at the moment the first real clash between the Qing dynasty when it brings the very vessels that Japan claims in 1894, it brings the Dingyuan and the Genuan to Nagasaki in a demonstration of Qing naval mastery of the seas to Japan on one of its tours. And what it really demonstrates is that the conversation or the propaganda competition between Japan and its neighbors long predates World War II. And this has intense ramifications because, and it goes back to uh, one of the questions that we heard uh, at the beginning, it's why the propaganda battles, I won't say war, but I'll say the battles did not end with the end of the war. It wasn't something that started with World War II, started way back in Meiji, uh, in the Meiji era between the Qing Dynasty and Meiji Japan. And it continues in the 21st century with modern Japan, and a CCP-led China in the 21st century. And for me, it's the timeline. And it's the timeline, therefore, on which the propaganda is based that makes it very different from, I think, how we see propaganda behave, generally speaking, in the West. Uh, we, we're getting a lot of good questions. And, and I do want to turn uh, to China uh, for the last couple of minutes. But we have two really uh, interesting questions. Um, could you briefly discuss the efforts to reach the Nikkei diaspora or foreign audiences? Uh, and uh, our colleague Paul Gregory at the Hoover Institution related to that asks, if you could comment on Japanese propaganda directed, directed against the USSR, uh, which was designed to win the loyalty of Manchuria's white Russian population. So the white Russians not the Red Russians. So two questions on how this propaganda played out beyond Japan's borders towards uh, foreign audiences. I, I sadly can't offer much on the propaganda oriented toward uh, the USSR because I, I haven't really looked into it, so I wouldn't be able to adequately uh, respect an interest, but I, I, I apologize uh, for, the, for the ignorance on that. In terms of the Nikkei diaspora, um, it becomes increasingly important for Japan to bring them on board because of their bilingual ability. Now, a lot of the individuals that get stuck in Japan, Tokyo Rose, uh, Buddy Uno and others, um, didn't necessarily always want to work for the Japanese in, in, by the time they get to the late 1930s, but they, they find themselves, uh, that's the only outlet uh, for, for, for stuff they can do. Um, Japanese had Japanese themselves had gone to America, people like Kawakami, um, who mastered English and became kind of 
self-ordained spokespeople for Japanese imperialism. Uh, it's an element of Japanese propaganda from the 19 teens through the 1930s. It's, I wouldn't say it's a major focus necessarily. It becomes more of a focus once the Japanese are interned in the US. And of course, this is very hypocritical uh, from, well, from anyone's standpoint, but certainly from the Japanese standpoint at the time. Uh, one of the issues I would say often gets overlooked is that the Japanese were very interested in other minorities in America and how they were being treated. And it's interesting to think of this, particularly nowadays when we're, we're looking at all sorts of minority issues in America, um, the Japanese were very focused on how black Americans were being treated. And uh, they saw that perhaps uh, obviously arising from the title they gained uh, over Russia, having representing quote at the time, one of the colored races, they, they saw themselves and they saw their propaganda as being able to appeal to minorities within democracies who were being maltreated. And that's something that, that stuck. And there was an element of that with uh, the, the Nikkei as well, uh, and not just in America, but in South America and Hawaii also, uh, but more importantly, other minorities at the same time. You mentioned the African-American, uh, the, the Japanese views of, of African-Americans. And it reminded me that when I was doing uh, the research for my second book on the, uh, the cultural history between Japan uh, and the US uh, called Pacific Cosmopolitans, that I ran across this incredibly rich um, vein of African-American newspapers in the United States in the 19th century that were keenly looking at Japan's modernization during this period. So they were looking at the Meiji uh, restoration period and the modernization that was happening uh, to see again, exactly how a, uh, a people that had been essentially you know, subjected or, or left behind in a sense in the world uh, was changing their, their own society. And, and so that I found fascinating and had some of that in the book. So I'm glad you mentioned it, that it actually continued on um, into, the, into the 20th century. Um, I wanna ask you two questions about China and then I wanna um, wrap up with a, a question we have on how this is playing out today and into the future. Um, the, the question I, I have, the two questions I have on China, one, uh, is what was Chinese propaganda like towards Japan? Um, was it as racist? Was it as dehumanizing as Japanese propaganda was? Did it have the same uh, sort of, of, of triumphalism even though losing the war? So earlier before the wars lost, it had the triumphalism. And then second, why in the world would the, uh, would the Chinese want to memorialize the lost ships by displaying the anchors? Wouldn't you wanna melt them down and turn them into bullets or bury them somewhere? Why would you put it into a museum to remind uh, yourself of, of that tragic and, you know, and humiliating loss? Thank you. Uh, the Chinese propaganda, we have to split between Chinese nationalist propaganda and Chinese communist propaganda, which both obviously exist on the mainland at the same time. They both started from a position of hate the game, not the player. So abhor the Japanese military, abhor the Japanese junta and the imperial system that has created this, but the individual Japanese themselves uh, are not in a sense responsible. And importantly, they can be turned. So the only mass surrenders of Japanese really anywhere in World War II is mostly to the Chinese communists who perfected this. They believed that individual Japanese, if given uh, the correct material and if taught or educated correctly, would see that their side, their aggressive warfare was wrong, and they would come over and join them in Yan'an as they did. The Chinese nationalists had a similar, somewhat benevolent policy of you know, bringing in Japanese POWs and they housed them in various camps in the west of Japan. And one major leftist Japanese, Kaji Wataru, works with them to shape propaganda toward the Japanese and they have call and response teams and they're writing the, the propaganda leaflets in uh, Japanese and they're more effective than American propaganda ever was. So it's a very different focus. They're not vituperative uh, and they want to demonstrate to the Japanese uh, a, a warm hand in welcoming them in a sense to the, other, to the other side. To the second question of why memorialize, it is an interesting question. And I see it as a way of them 
regaining or overcoming the humiliation that they feel that the, the, first it was the Chinese nationalists, but then it was the, the Chinese communists of overcoming that Qing era humiliation of being defeated by Imperial Japan and by reclaiming the anchor first by the Chinese nationalists and then displaying that anchor, they now own in a sense that anchor and they have reclaimed uh, the power in a sense to tell that story. And this becomes extremely important to both the nationalists uh, and, and the Chinese communists. It's interesting to note along those same lines that there is a project to, re to salvage the rest of the Dingyuan and it's been restored now up in Shandong province. I haven't had a chance to get there yet because as I was going to go, uh, things kind of started to devolve with the pandemic in China, but there's a massive theme park sort of historical museum setting up in, in Northeast China and the Dingyuan has been restored. Um, it is an interesting issue. The Japanese have done the same in a sense with um, you know, the museum at the Yasukuni Shrine, memorializing a defeat in a way also allows one to uh, have the upper hand in how they're going to narrate that to their domestic constituents. So I think there's, there's two, two uh, features at work there. Yeah, and of course, history between Japan and China is extraordinarily fraught. There have been attempts by academics to come to a, a sort of joint understanding of history or, or a joint presentation of it. Uh, but this is something that plays out in the politics, whether it's um, Chinese and, and other Asian nations uh, being angry at, at the presentation of the war in Japanese textbooks uh, or, or questions about Yasukuni Shrine and the war criminals enshrined in there. So we do, we have a question, it's the final question uh, that we'll be able to get to. And I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of the other questions, uh, but it's about today and, and tomorrow. Uh, and it uh, is a question about uh, whether over the next 10 or 20 years, who will be able to better control this narrative over uh, the wars, uh, the, the Sino-Japanese wars, as well as World War II? Um, will it be Japan? Will it be China? Um, will there be a stable understanding? Will it fade or get more, uh, more intense? How, in essence, will it play out between Japan and China? But then also the United States, uh, the questioner asks, uh, it seems that the United States uh, actually takes a view of the early 20th century closer to China's than Japan's, which is that Japan is the aggressor and the colonizer and China is the victim. Uh, so does that complicate relations between Tokyo and Washington as well? Oh, thank, thank you for this question and thank everybody um, in, in the ether sphere for, for all these uh, fine questions. I think we're going to find our we are finding ourselves currently right now in a very strange environment because over the last 10 years under Xi Jinping, the Chinese communist state, the PRC wants to control the narrative of its domestic history and its international history to the to such an extent that it has basically closed all archives. Uh, in order that no one can find evidence to the contrary to what it says. But what that means is that all historical research about China, since it can't be done within China, is now being done outside of China. And so on the contrary, it doesn't control the situation as much as it would like because everyone's gonna be writing about and everyone is writing about China from the outside looking at all new sources. I think the, so the, the competition has heated up. We see this, of course, I mean, Abe has obviously left as prime minister, but uh, the Japan conference, the Nippon Kaigi, a relatively uh, very influential and conservative lobbying group in Japan still kind of holds the reins for the government's historical understanding of what happened in the past. And as you mentioned, um, America is in, in the fray as well. I think one thing to keep in mind is what, um, one Pulitzer Prize winning uh, novelist has said uh, is just memory. And his offering of this was the way in which he saw perhaps how America and Vietnam could arrive at a historical reconciliation in a way that they haven't before. That it's not just about remembering the war from one's own domestic position, but it's about remembering uh, the war or remembering an event from the other side. This doesn't necessarily uh, mean placing blame, this doesn't necessarily mean 
Uh, it's about aggressor or victim, although obviously that comes into the situation. It's about realizing that your memory of a particular moment is only half that memory. Uh, and in the world of propaganda, the other half of that memory will be shared by a competing team in a sense. And until those two sides find some form of not reconciliation per se, and that I agree with you, but of sharing these memories with each other, then no reconciliation or no formal understanding will continue or will evolve and we'll, we'll be facing a further heated argument. And I thought that was a very kind of cogent point that we need to take into consideration the other and the emotion, uh, the memory, the fear that the other had in order to come to a fuller understanding perhaps of what happened. And only then can we start on the path toward reconciliation. So it's not about textbooks. It's not gonna be necessarily about cultural sharing. It's gonna be about a basic concept of what it means to share memory first and then see where that leads. Oh, Barack, thank you. I wish we could uh, talk more about this. Um, your chapter is extremely interesting, especially the implications it has going forward. Um, the rest of the book is, is fascinating. I hope everyone will uh, have a chance to take a look at it or see the online or in-person exhibition and to talk about uh, the rest of the uh, events in this series. I'd like to turn it back to Eric Waken, our deputy director and the director of library and archives. So Barack, thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you so much, Barack. And thank you so much, Michael, for uh, facilitating and moderating. What an excellent, excellent talk and excellent uh, Q&A. Thanks so much. Really looking forward to the, uh, the next few sessions. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, on Thursday the 10th, we will have another lecture entitled War Fever. Um, war fever as fueled by the media and popular culture, the path taken by Meiji Japan's policies of enrich the country and strengthen the armed forces. Those are quotes. The speaker is Toshihiko Kishi, professor at the Center for Southeast Asian Studies at Kyoto University, and it will be moderated by our own curator, Dr. Kei Ueda, curator of the Japanese diaspora collection. Um, thanks so much for coming. I look forward to seeing you at the next event in this series. Please give a warm round of applause virtually to Barack and Michael again for their help. Thank you so much. Thank you.